Hi, welcome back to Rock Forever. We've got a special guest. He is bass player, songwriter, extraordinaire, Connie Hatch, and so much more. Please welcome Andy Curran. Jay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice welcome and, and good to be on Rock Forever. I guess yes. that's what I guess that's what you and I do. We rock it. forever. I, I'm, I'm looking at the James Gang hat. And if anybody is uh, Rock Forever, it's it's Joe Walsh and, you know, the the, the great music that uh, never dies. You know, that that 70s music that we grew up on just seems like it's the blueprint, you know, for everything moving forward and what new bands are compared to and you know, traditionally some of the biggest, you know, concert draws, whether it be the summer outdoor sheds or these arena tours or festivals, you know, what, what do you think it was about the, the, the music in the seventies that is so endearing? Well, I'm proudly wearing my James gang baseball cap and I got, I was lucky enough to see the band um, play a reunion show at the Beacon Theater in New York City, and I'm, I'm a massive, massive Joe Walsh fan, but um, when James Gang were playing, I was too young to benefit to go see them, so when, when they put the original lineup uh, back together, Jay, I was there with bells on, but um, I think, you know, personally speaking for myself, um, and, and I think it's maybe applicable to anybody that's listening to your show, your audience members, um, that the music that we grow up grow up on, it's a snapshot in time for us. So when I was growing up listening to um, Deep Purple and James Gang and UFO and the Scorpions and Aerosmith and Rick Derringer and Edgar Winter, those are bands to me that I still love. And you're right, they when they go play, I just saw the, the Rolling Stones, you know, they, they earned 10 million bucks in one night, you know, and, and it's just crazy that all of these retro bands um, are, are still out there doing really well, but they, but when I hear that music, it takes me back to when I was, a t uh, you know, 16 and 17 or even, even younger. Um, so it stays with you and it's hard for me to pull myself away because people say that about Coney Hatch. They're like, man, I, I grew up with you and, and you're part of the fiber of my, my teenage years. So that, that for me, when I talk about James gang, it just brings back amazing memories and listening to that live at the Carnegie Hall record, uh, James Gang Rides Again, it's just unbelievable. Brings me back to when I was 16, Jay. Yeah, I was lucky enough to see that reunion tour right up the street here at Universal Amphitheater. And it was uh, it was an awesome show. But uh, Joe, Joe Walsh is pretty incredible. There's not yeah. too many things that that guy has done. I think he's, you know, in, in rejuvenated the the eagles career when he got involved and put a nice little bit of edge onto that band but um you're right that old music even i watched the tom petty documentary about wildflowers and um i think about all the times i've seen tom petty and it's amazing how we go back to the music that we grew up on yeah it's definitely a special place in our heart and it it, it inspires us you know it uh, it keeps you young too i know you're you're young at heart like myself that you put that music on takes you back to uh you know coming up getting your first driver's license you know going on your first <laughs> date you know skipping school and getting in trouble you know it's funny you mentioned to getting your driver's license whenever i hear uh, deep purple highway star uh, it's something just wants me to push the gas pedal and I probably got a couple speeding tickets while listening to that song <laughs> yeah we can we can blame all our heroes definitely but you guys, Connie Hatch, formed in 81, of course, debut album produced by Kim Mitchell. You know, uh, you were on the great Mercury label. So many great bands were on that label. Of course, you know, Rush and later Bon Jovi and Scorpions and, you know, so, so much great, you know, from the Polygram family. Talk about um, coming up and, you know, getting that deal and making that first record, because I know we're going to be talking about the the benefit aspect of that debut album cover and all that. Talk, yeah. about, talk about the excitement of, you know, getting that deal and making that record. You know, Jay, that was a pretty incredible time for us. All of us were very, very young at that point. I was the baby in the band. I think I was probably uh, 18 or 19 when we formed. And um, for any of your listeners that don't know who Kim Mitchell is, he was the uh, lead guitarist and founder of a, a really great Canadian rock band called Max Webster. And Max Webster toured a lot with Rush. They Rush brought them all over the States and um, into Europe and stuff like that. So having somebody at the level of Kim Mitchell to take us under his wing 
siblings and mentor us and do a record with us. And I mean, we had been playing in the clubs for maybe about a year to two, two years and mixing cover songs with original stuff. So Kim basically plucked us from obs obscurity and the minute we went in and did a five song demo with him, we had a lot of label interest and it attracted the attention of Ray Daniels, who was Rush's manager and, and still is. And um, so we immediately got signed to Anthem in Canada. But what that meant was it opened up the doors to play in, in your country and get signed to Mercury. And uh, I can remember at, at the time when our first record came out, I went to see Bon Jovi at a club called the Alma Combo in Toronto because it was their first time that they had played and they were label mates. And um, it was a pretty special time because I'm a big Scorpions fan and um, they were on the label as well. And just going, oh my God, this is like, we're in with all the big boys now. So. Um, that was went from literally playing clubs that were anywhere between maybe, you know, 250 to four, four to 500 people to being a, an opening act on the Judas Priest screaming for vengeance tour and playing to 17,000 people. So uh, a rude awakening and quite a rocket ride. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. I went to college on the Canadian border just south of Vancouver, right there in Bellingham and used to go up and see um, those early shows, you know, with uh Judas Priest and everywhere, you know, all the, all the bands playing the little, uh, you know, hockey arenas, you know, and uh, really got to know the uh, Canadian people and, and, and the market well. So uh, it was exciting, I'm sure, to not only go out with Judas Priest, but I know in 83, you opened 40 Iron Maiden shows. That was quite yeah. a challenge. Tell us, tell us about, you know, uh, holding your own, you know, going out there in front of that Maiden audience. Yeah, I, that's a great question, Jay. And, and whether it was Maiden or Judas Priest or some of the other heavier acts that we toured with Accept and Crocus and um, obviously Iron Maiden fans, they're, they're pretty diehard. So we, um, a couple things happened with us. I, I don't think we were anywhere as heavy as any of those bands. I would consider Coney Hatch more hard rock. So we, it was sort of like when in Rome do as the Romans and we had to change our set list up a little bit and um, play a, a bit of, a bit of the heavier material that we had and um, and same with our wardrobe it was kind of like okay we should maybe dress in, the, in as much black as we can and fit in right so we did it we did our best to fit in on those tours and win those audiences over because they were really not interested in any opening act or any band that wasn't metal, but we had some pretty good airplay on, at MTV at that time and rock radio in, in the US. So there was a, a track called Devil's Deck that was getting a lot of airplay. And that was um, when Steve Harris from Iron Maiden heard that uh, song. Um, he said he was always a big Coney Hatch fan. So they invited us out for the, for the Peace of Mind tour. So when you think about it back then, the Screaming for Vengeance tour with Priest and, and the Peace of Mind tour with Maiden were arguably the biggest tours of the, that those bands' careers. They were really hitting their strides. So timing was everything. It was like, you know, we'd been hit by a bolt of lightning and we were out on these major tours getting major exposure. But um, we had to earn our we had to earn our keep every night. And there was there was some pretty hostile uh, reaction first couple songs with with fans giving us the finger and screaming at us to get off the stage. So we were just told by Maiden and Priest, stick in there, put your head down, rock. And, you know, eventually they'll they'll warm up to you, which is what happened. So most nights we went over really well, Jay. Yeah, I know it's uh, it's crazy when you think about it, because the set times are set, you know, these. Uh idiots in the front thinking you going off early is going to bring their headliner on sooner you know it's, <laughs> it's like no they're, they're coming on at nine o'clock don't worry about it you know unless you want to have s sit there and uh, you know have the lights on in the arena you know chill out man you know warm warm yourself up because it's, well, uh, uh, yeah it's in san show. francisco we, we played the cow palace in front of um i remember it vividly one of the biggest uh, audiences we played to i think on the judas priest tour and when those lights went down um, there was kids chucking M1 firecrackers at us and tennis balls and all kinds of stuff, you know, and we just, we were just like, okay, this is like, uh, this is like guerrilla warfare up here. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to have to watch our backs. Right. But uh, those were in the days before they would check your pockets, but I can remember the, the heat of those M1 firecrackers going off in front of us. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. It's like trial by fire. It's like, look, we're not going anywhere, you know, get used to it because yeah. we're, uh, we're totally. here to rock. So if you uh, if you take a breath, then you, you'll, you'll understand there was a reason why 
Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. Aiden, Aiden, you know, Iron Maiden brought us on this show. You yeah. Know, for you. Yeah. We were invited out. The, 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 yeah. The audience didn't know that, but um, you're right. There's, and, and I, even, you know, working with Rush over the years and seeing, um, getting the opportunity to open up for that band, their fans are very particular. It's, it's almost like the opening acts are an inconvenience, right? So you do your best to, to win them over with some, some showmanship. And if you've got some recognizable tracks on the radio, all of a sudden you see people's, um, recognition going, oh, okay. I, I know who, who these guys are. They've, you know, we used to get airplay in, in your neck of the woods on KNAC and um, some of the rock stations in LA. So it was, it was good once that recognition point kicked in and, and then it was always uh, like almost a validation. Oh, okay. That's why you guys are up here. You got, you got some songs on MTV, right? Yeah. Well, the eighties were, uh, were a great time and I know you guys soldiered on uh, and not without challenges, you know, I've uh, interviewed your your lead singer, Carl Dixon. And of course, he had a horrific car crash in 08 and he's rehabilitated and back playing with you guys. What 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 can you say about the inner strength, you know, of Carl that uh, he he came back? He didn't give up. You know, he really um, did what it took to uh, keep the rock alive. Yeah, you know what? Amazing perseverance and and a, and a testament to his character. Um, I'll go into a little bit of detail with you and tell you that, you know, after Coney Hatch had, had broken up sort of officially in 1985, 86, um, it was not a bitter breakup. We just felt that the band had run its course. So it wasn't like we were not on friendly terms with each other. And we always kept in touch, all of the members. And there was various um, fundraisers here in Toronto where we had a big following. And we would come out of the woodwork every now and then, almost like Spinal Tap and, and do the re reunion gigs. And people would be like, I thought you guys were never playing again. And we'd come back again and do another reunion gig and another reunion gig, right? But um Point being that uh, still very friendly with Carl and we heard the news that he had was involved in a head on car collision in, in Australia and the family reached out and the doctors were he was in an induced coma his injuries were really really bad like he's he's lucky to be alive. And um, the doctors had had advised at that point that maybe the family reach out to some friends and put the phone up to Carl's ear and, you know, keep his cognitive, um, maybe his, his cognitive sort of uh, whatever was happening in his mind, um, keep it moving, even though he was in an induced coma. So they were enc encouraging phone calls and people to recognizable voices. And so when I called him, I said, hey, um, they put the phone up to his ear and I said, hey, bro, we got a lot more rock and diddy. You got to get back into town and, and, and we're going to be out there, um, play some shows. And we hadn't played in quite some time then. And Jay, when he got home and he had got, got out of the coma and he was in a wheelchair, one of the first things he said to me is, let's talk about those shows um, that you mentioned. And, and he was in, in a coma and I was like, oh, my God, now we got to make good on this thing. Right. <laughs> so we uh, we put the band back together and played some shows, which actually spawned a record deal offer for for the Coney Hatch Four record. Um, I think maybe what was that, 2016 or something like that. So um, we're kind of like we we've had these nine lives with Coney Hatch, where we keep coming back. And and that, but Carl is a trooper man, and he's singing better than ever. Um, he's got some great scars to show his war wounds, but uh, he's a survivor. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, definitely inspiring. You know, we think we got problems and then we see someone who has overcome much, much more than we have and uh, makes you feel grateful, you know, for what you have and certainly uh, a, a, a great, um, you know, role model for people that have had, you know, uh, challenges. But now we're talking about um, Unison Fund. We're talking about benefiting, you know, the Canadian music um, community, you know, with counseling and relief yeah. work and, and, and all that. And you're offering signed artwork and photographs of the classic debut album. And uh, I know Martin, is it spring it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. He's the, uh, the illustrator. What an amazing uh, piece of art. Talk about the impetus to put this together and, and, and why Unison Fund is so important. Yeah, Jay, thank you for giving me the opportunity and the platform to talk about this because um, 
uh, you know, during COVID, I think uh, for me, I, I was pretty lucky that um, my livelihood does not depend solely on playing live shows, but I looked at so many of my friends and peers and different bands and the, the rug was really pulled out from underneath um, musicians who who rely on touring to stay alive. And I'm not, and, and I'm talking about bands of every, every level, you know, whether it's uh, my friends in, in the band, the Tea Party or Big Wreck or even Carl Dixon or the, my friends in Cheap Trick, you know, these guys are all off the road. So there's an amazing, um, there's an amazing organization here in Canada called the Unison Fund. And they, um, they started with a, with a donation from Rush of a million dollars to get it up and running. And essentially what it does, Jay, is it, it, it provides resources for people in the music industry, primarily musicians and road crew um, and, and people from record companies, all walks of life that, that perhaps don't have any medical benefits or, or really need some help with, um, with prescriptions or their rehabilitation from an injury like Carl or, or even just staying alive during COVID. So I thought, well, what, what can I do in a very small way? And um, when Martin Spring at the illustrator of the, the first album cover reached out to me, um, I ended up purchasing that artwork off him and, and uh, he felt that it should be back in the hands of, of one of the guys in the band. So luckily for me, I was able to buy that. And it's actually behind me there. You can kind of see it up there on the wall. That's the original album cover. And um, so we got it scanned, digitally scanned. And Martin and I came up with the idea to maybe offer a limited amount of those uh, on my website, um, andykernmusic.ca. And um, we thought, okay, we'll, we'll sign it, we'll number it. And when... Well, another friend of mine who had taken some photographs of Coney Hatch back in 1982, he said, well, I've got some great photos that, that nobody's ever seen. What do you think about if we do, do, do it, those as well as the artwork? So um, all of the net proceeds will go back to, to Unison. You know, we've, we've pulled in some great people to help us print them and our merch company is going to help get it out to people. But it really was my way of like, what can I do? Like, I'm just one person. What can I do to try to help um, out the music community here in Canada. So, get, you know, even being able to talk about it on, on your show and let people know that, hey, it's not just Curran try to put money in his wallet. I'm actually trying to help other people. So if anybody's out there listening and they love that artwork or they love Coney Hatch, I would love you to just, you know, make, make a, a purchase because it's all going to very, very good, good, good cause. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's important to help others. You know, it always comes back to you. And I know the website is rockpapermerch.com. Yes. You can go on there and see the, not only the beautiful artwork, but some of the photographs and, and everything that Andy's talking about. And um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's an amazing illustration that Martin did. And you've got the original right there. Is, is it like done in, in like pen or what, 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 what format did he, paint that in obviously there's yeah. color in there but it's very you know very exact. yeah i know I'll, I'll, I'll like it's it's pretty far away there you can see it up on the corner um in my in my studio but no he he and i spoke about it and i think he he did it with with a fine tip pen and different colors and he was a well-known illustrator for the magazine heavy metal um that's where he came onto our radar when we were looking for someone to do the, the artwork for the first coney hatch debut record and when i when i spoke to martin about it he originally from england and we hit it off pretty well because my parents are also from england i get along pretty well with tea bags um anyway he he said he, he remembers it taking him like two and a half to three weeks to draw that by hand um and it's very, very intricate and very fine pens and, and amazing, robust colors on it. And um, a lot of people who are big Coney Hatch fans say to this day that it's one of their favorite album covers. But the concept behind it was the name Coney Hatch it was a psychiatric hospital north of London in a town called Muswell Hill. And uh, it took me back there. There was a big brick wall that surrounds the whole compound. And they, as kids, thought that... Um, uh, a, a lot of a lot of times the loonies were going to jump over the wall after them, right? So when I told that story to Martin, that was his his sort of perception of drawing these walls that were surrounding this psychiatric hospital. So that's that's the story behind it. Yeah, well, they can go on the website rockpapermerch.com and see it in all its full glory and expand it, blow it up. You know, it's a it's a phenomenal piece and. 
Yeah, like like we say, I know we have Music Cares here in America, which is part of NERIS, you know, the Grammy organization. And, you know, so many of us in the mu music community are, are vulnerable. You know, we didn't uh, work in some corporate environment where there's all sorts of benefits and, and uh, y you know, a pension plan and, and all that. So it's so important to, to be able to have some type of support system, no matter how, how small it is, you know, that people sometimes just need a little uh, crutch or a little step, you know, to get back on their feet. And, you know, more importantly, they, um, they provided so much service for, for the music. I always, I always say, if you love a band, you love this song, you love this album, just think of all the people that are behind it, all the, the, the crews and lawyers and accountants and the assistants and like yep. the graphic people and the, you, you know, the, the, the people that it takes, the managers and the, and the crew members and everything that it takes. And I always say, you know, when we honor, you know, these artists, we, we really should be honoring their whole world. You know, the people that made that happen because you don't go to an arena show and the band had just, uh, pulled up in a van and, and drop some gear off. I mean, there's trucks right. and union guys and, you know, all, all the uh, incredible lighting and audio people and everything that it takes to put on these shows. And of course, in the recording studio, the engineers and producers and everything. And, and I think it's so important for all of us to really, really remember and, and, and praise all the people that are behind the records that we love. Jay, that, that, that you've, you've touched on so many points that a lot of people you know, they go to a show and they just arrive and lights go down and boom, it starts. But you're right, like the back of all of the work that, that it takes to get those shows happening and the road crews and all of the, the months and months of booking ahead of time. And then and then you even touched it on the record side, you know, all the months and months of recording and pre-production and um, guys like Martin Springett, who um, is a fellow musician as well. I think that's why it resonated with him to get involved in this. But the many, many hours it took him to make those, that, to, to make that album cover and, and for us to be able to share it with fans, um, but then have the, have the, the money that's raised to go to a great cause like Music Cares, like you know, the Unison Fund is very much like um, Music Cares. So I don't know, I, I'm not trying to be wholesome or the spiritual here, but I, I sometimes go, well, what can I do? I'm, I'm one guy, what can I do to help? And this was my way uh, during COVID to, to look around. And once I heard about so many of my friends that, that were just stuck in their tracks and couldn't play any shows or just couldn't do any, um, really to get together in any recording uh, facet and, and make records, I thought, okay, well, this could be cool. So um, anybody that loves hard rock or knows any Coney Hatch fans, you know, do, do, do yourself a favor because it's karma. It's good. What comes around goes around. Uh, you help someone else and before you know it, something good happens to you. So I'm hoping that um, that we'll sell a bunch of these. I'd love not, nothing more than to sell them out, Jay, and, and people like yourself helping spread the word. Um, thank you. I, I couldn't thank you more. You know, I need to do more of this and let people know that this uh, this project's out there. Well, it really is important. And, you know, um, I know it takes some work to put it together, but the um, what you put into it, like I say, goes a long way to help others. And it always comes back to you. And, you know, everyone should be thinking of how we're in this together and, and, and help each other. You know, none of us are in a, on an island, you know, on our right. own. It's all, it's all one world, one, one people, you know. Now, I know I, I'd be remiss to not uh, mention, and I know um, Alex has uh, uh, put, put some of the work out there, but you, you worked with your friend Alex Lifeson on his solo work that he's been doing. Um, what can you say about that? And what's the most rewarding thing about seeing Alex stay, stay creative? <laughs> Well, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll answer your last question because first, because, um, you know, having worked with the guys in Rush over the years and then to be there for the chapter um, of Neil's passing and, and that, that's the sadness that, um, that, you know, the challenges that Neil himself went through not once but twice and then um, seeing how it affected Getty and Alex and, and if anything, um, it's quite rewarding to see that Alex, uh, maybe you know, two years later, is coming out on the other side and wanting to 
record music and just get back busy again was extremely rewarding to see because I consider him my friend first. So being able to, you know, he pulled me out of the dugout and, and getting that phone call was surreal. I, I jokingly said to him, you know, you're asking me to play bass on this stuff. Don't you know any other bass players? I think there's a guy on speed dial whose initials are GL. Why are you know what? And wondering why he hadn't called Getty, but um and Getty was traveling and working on his book and stuff like that. So, you know, just to even get a call from Alex to say, would you play bass on? It was just like a full on pinch me moment. Um, and, and those tracks ended up being used in a, in a promotional video for his uh, his Epiphone guitar. But fast forward, um, Alex and I are working on a side project and the, and, the, and the band is called Envy of None. And so some of those tracks that I played bass on have ended up with a vocalist singing on them, a young vocalist from Portland, Oregon, by the name of Maya Wynn. And we have 10 songs completed now, Jay. And, and so that record, we're just about to announce it, that we're, we've signed with the label and that record is going to be coming out next year. But um, like I said, it's just in, in what world was I ever going to be collaborating with Alex Lifeson? I, I was like, if you had asked me a couple of years ago, I'd be like, okay, uh, you know, go, go maybe have a, a couple more drinks, Jay, and, and tell me how you're feeling after that. But um, it's been a, a really fun and very re rewarding to see Alex get back in a place where he's creating again. Yeah, I know with the passing of Neil, it was the end of the chapter. And, you know, so, so many fans naive to how intricate the relationships were. Think, oh, just get another drummer, you know, rush, get back together, get it, get it out there. But we, 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 we know just like when Led Zeppelin lost John Bonham, it was a vital part of their fabric, you know, yes. and you just can't bring in another drummer, you know, it just, it's not the same band, you know, and I know, uh, I, I know Alex has got a great heart. I've uh, interviewed him a couple of times when he's come out here to LA for the Robbie Krieger golf tournament, Yes, you know, yeah. for the That's city a big of, one for him. Yeah. 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 For St. John's and helping the kids with cancer. And, uh, you know, you can see, of course he loves golf, but he, he didn't fly out all the way here just to play golf. You know, it's to, to raise funds and awareness and of course jam with some great people and, and, and all that. But, um, I, I know in speaking to so many musicians that you, you got to have a heart, you know, you gotta, you gotta give back because we're, we're blessed, you know, for what all that we've achieved, you know, any, anything that we've been able to do is, is a blessing, you know, with such a competitive, you know, nature out there. So uh, it's, it's great to see that. And I'm sure, I'm sure Getty's the, the same way. And uh, yeah, it's amazing to see all that. Well, again, we want to remind everybody, rockpapermerch.com. That's where you can go and purchase your incredibly signed artwork, photographs, all, all the great stuff. It is uh, truly a rock treasure that you can put up in your man cave or yes, your, for your sure. office there and, um, you, you know, throw some Connie Hatch on and and, and relive the, uh, the amazing launch of the band and all those great tours you saw him on with Maiden and Priest. And of course, right here in Hollywood, you guys played with Accept and Rough Cut, right at the Hollywood Palladium, right there on Sunset Boulevard. We we did, and we played a couple nights with Priest at the, um, uh, remind me um, where the, uh, the big, uh, what is it, the, the boat that they turned into the hotel. Um, oh yeah, the, you're talking about the Long Beach, the Queen Mary? Queen Mary, yeah. So we played two nights at the Long Beach Arena with uh, Judas Priest, and, and that was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, the Crocus, uh, except one at the Palladium, it was a, a great backstage party. Um, I remember meeting Ronnie James Dio back there, and the guys at Motley Crue showed up, and it was like a who's who of celebrities down there. So lots of good memories of, uh, of, of playing in Los Angeles. But you touched on this too, Jay. One one final thing that I I would like to say is that I I consider myself extremely fortunate and lucky to be making music still after all of these years. And um, and I know Getty and Alex feel the same way about trying to help people. Um, you know, when you're lucky enough to have success, it's great to try to look on the other side and and see if you can help out people that um, may not as be. Uh, in in the, a similar place financially or spiritually or whatever so this whole thing that you've allowed me to talk about on, on rock forever is is all about helping other people so um i can't thank you enough jay for having me on buddy well our special guest is andy curran 
you know him from Connie Hatch and so much more. Get ready for his his new band with uh, with Alex Lifeson and that great singer from Portland. We can't wait to hear those those vocals, man, over your over your music. So rockpapermerch.com is the site. Please go and support, plant some seeds, you know, for the future and help others. It uh, it always blossoms into something to come back to you. Andy, it's a, been a real pleasure. I can't wait to follow your uh, uh, definitely adventures with this band and hope to speak to you again on that. Yeah, Jay, thank you very much. And, and thanks for the plug on, on the project that we're doing and Envy of None. Keep your ears and eyes open for that. There's going to be some cool, exciting news coming up on, on that. And hopefully, uh, who knows, maybe we'll get down to uh, California again one of these days. <laughs> 